this exciting event. Um, this part will be focused on, on case studies on the main challenges of conservation applied genetics. Uh, will we, will, we will start with a first block um, about attacks, damage identification and forensics um, with uh, Raquel Godinho from CDO in Bio University of Porto. Um, and then um, we'll have the, the opportunity to, to have with us uh, Bettina Dobrescu from the Forest Research Institute uh, from Baden-Württemberg. Um, after each block, we will have uh, five minutes uh, for questions. So for those attending online, please share your questions on the questions, questions and answers block. Um, so Raquel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, but, uh, um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, and first of all, thank you very much for this invitation to be here um, talking about this work. Um, this is uh, a work that I've been, is a project that I've been developing with my colleague um, from University of, As of Asturias, Jose Vicente Lopez Bau. And um, so I'm, I'm giving, uh, uh, this is a 10 minutes talk, so it's just an approach and the first results we are getting from, from this project. And I'm happy to reply to your questions later. Um, so everyone knows that large carnivores um, engage people for many things from from uh, uh, fear to from wonder to fear. Uh, but uh, there are very high rich, uh, high uh, protein rich uh, uh, diets also uh, generates a lot of conflict. And, uh, and this uh, conflict uh, is high and, and generally um, is also reflected in the media. And uh, the, the, the news are uh, um, of many, many, uh, angles we can see it uh, they are very spread very different approaches uh, but there is many times a uh, distrust from the farmers and we can see that here on this on this um, on this uh, uh, new uh, of, uh, on these notes um, sorry from the newspaper where we can say that uh, people are saying that the, the ranger says it was not a wolf but the photos leave no doubt this animal belly, the animal's belly is completely turned open. If it is, if it was not a wolf, tell us what it was. And this is the feeling of people uh, that do not believe on what the rangers and the technicians say about um, uh, the identification of the predator. So this was our main motivation for this work and uh, where we are trying to evaluate the effectiveness of the assessment that the rangers uh, do when they go to the places and they on or, or where livestock losses happen and they uh, assess which was the predator so we were we with this project we are trying to uh, two things we are trying for at the first place to uh, assess the effectiveness of this evaluation that is done in the field, but also using um, uh, marking very well uh, where was the bite, where is where was the attack happened. Uh, we then will try to relate uh, the position of the, the where the attack actually happened in the animal. Um, with the result. 
trying to be uh, to have uh, a better assessment or or giving more tools to uh, the ranchers and to the administration of what of how to classify the the, the attacks. So our case study um, is done in Asturias. These results that I will show you are from um, attacks in Asturias. And uh, we target, of course, bear, brown bear, and wolf. So fortunately, Cristiano uh, told us this morning a lot about uh, barcodes. And, uh, and I don't need to tell you that this is done with a, very, a short sequence of DNA that has enough variation uh, to uh, separate, to split the species, but very low intraspecific variation. And of course, again, the identification is done by comparison against a reference database, and this reference database must be uh, very, uh, very good. Um, when we analyze forensic samples, we have an additional uh, problem uh, that is also with environmental DNA, of course, uh, but uh, that is the multiple sources of DNA in the same sample. So at least minimal, we have the predator and we have the prey. Um, so uh, in technical terms, this is not um, a simple analysis. Uh, uh, and we fortunately, we have now a very efficient tool uh, in genetics that is sequencing in parallel. So of a sample, of the same sample, we can sequence everything that is inside the, that sample. So we extract the DNA of everything and then sequence everything together. This was not possible some years ago. And this is what you have all uh, uh, heard about ice throughput sequencing. And from this kind of sequencing, we get millions of sequences, many thousands or millions of sequences. And we, we with very low, uh, presence of DNA, we can identify uh, the species. So, and this is called metabarcoding, as we heard this morning. So, what we applied was so we 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 asked the rangers to collect the saliva only on the bites on bites compatible uh, with the killing. Uh, we are not interested in any survival or any part of the, of the body. We are only interested in these skills that we can, they can identify exactly where was the bite um, that killed the animal. And then we used two uh, barcodes, two regions, two, sequence, two regions of DNA. And, and we have sequenced with this isocode sequencing. We did two replicates for each sample, so two extractions and two preparation of the DNA and, and two um, sequencing. Um, and uh, we have about uh, an average of 70,000 reads per sample per replicate. And, sorry. So the two regions that we have used uh, was the 12S is a very, very universal uh, region for mammals, a small fragment of about 150 base pairs. And then we design our own primers to identify, uh, to split wolves and dogs. This is uh, uh, not uh, so um, easy, but using the mitochondria, um, each, it, it is, there's a region where we can uh, split them apart. So we uh, do these two fragments uh, together. And uh, these results that I will show you are the, from the analysis of 145 cases that we have the results here so far, but we are continuing the, the project. And um, these results are coming from five prey, uh, common prey, cattle, horse, sheep, goat, and donkey. And the first result that I will show you is that, in fact, we could, so with these fragments, with these approaches, we can identify the prey as well. This is normally what we want because the, the guard or the ranger was to collect the sample and, of course, he knows and he, he, he reported the prey. Uh, but we always confirm. So we reported a cattle 
was it a cattle uh, or not? And, and uh, we got 100% match with the reported uh, price. So this was a good um, result or first good result. And we also, our, our uh, most uh, um, uh, predator, the predator that we found most in, in our samples was the wolf. This is also not surprising. Um, and in fact, uh, these 101 wolves um, or cases where, um, that we found on our samples were also reported by the ranger as a, a, a wolf attack. So this is 100% coincident. Um, then we found attacks from three uh, bears on, on ship. And again, this was coincident. So the, the, the ranger said that it was a bear. And bear attacks are uh, very uh, interesting because although they have they are much less frequent. They generate a lot more of um, media and of uh, conflict. Um, in, in fact, what he said here is that the bear kill, uh, kills for sheep and it's, it's very mediatic when, when there's an, an attack of, of uh, a bear, although very little uh, number of attacks exist. Um, so this is uh, potentially an interesting thing. And then uh, I, sorry, because it lost the color, I don't know why, uh, but then we have also uh, some dogs. So we could identify uh, which um, were very robustly that some of the tags were, uh, no, some, some of, the, of, the, of the cases were, only at dog DNA. Uh, in fact, we don't know if the dog was the predator, but we know that we didn't find DNA of other predator on that case. Might be scavenging, yes, might be, uh, but we don't have um, more information uh, than that um, in the case, in this case. But more interesting is that, sorry, the cover is here now. So more interesting is that, uh, in fact, here the rangers were not so efficient uh, because they report, for instance, a case of a bear attack where we found dog DNA only, no bear. Uh, and also in some cases for wolf, um, for, um, reports of wolf attacks. In fact, we only found DNA from dogs. Uh, again, we don't know if it was in fact a dog, but that was the DNA that we could find inequivocally on those uh, samples. And then we also have things that we don't like so much, so the fails. Uh, we do have a percentage of about 40% of the samples that we cannot identify. We have only DNA from the prey, and, but could not find enough reads that we are, uh, 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 that we certify that are from a predator. And then we have also samples that have different sources of DNA, uh, red fox, dog, uh, even uh, badgers, and, um, and uh, samples that either have mixed uh, DNA uh, uh, or have only DNA from, for sure for scavenging and, and uh, are not also, um, so we cannot identify also the predator. So this, this is uh, our, my message here today for, your, for the, my 10 minutes. Uh, we know and we can reliable identifying the forensic samples, no uh, problem at the moment. And we believe that this low number of bear attacks 
but high level of conflict may worse a, a, a genetic identification on of all cases. This is not the case for for wolves, for instance. But uh, as far as we believe, but maybe for wolves, uh, for brown bear, it would worse uh, or attacks being identified by molecular methods. And that, that's it. Thank you very much. I'm happy to receive questions. Okay, thank you, thank you, Raquel. Um, now, Bettina Dobrescu. Ah, okay. Raquel, this what? Maybe Joaquin, you can we can wait until the the end of the of the of this section, please. Yeah. Right, thank you. Um, Bettina, uh, if you are here, you can share your screen. No, yeah. Your, oh, no, 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 it's your, no, me. But Bettina, let me see. Okay. Is, uh, yeah, she can. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to this workshop and uh, to have the possibility to contribute online. Um, I hope you can see my presentation. Okay, I'm just starting. Um, second. So, um, yes, my name is Bettina Dwesko, and I am working at the Forest Research Institute in Baden-Württemberg, Germany, who is also project partner of the Eurolarch Carnivores project. And I'm working at the Lynx and Wolf Working Group, um, especially on wildlife genetics and I want to talk to you about a new project which has started identification of carcass use by predators and mammalian scavengers. Um, so as a short introduction I want to give you a quick overview of um, this is only a very simple flow chart usually the processes are um, more complex and um, it's about identification and management of large carnivore kills in Baden-Württemberg. Um, we at the Lynx and Wolf working group, um, we have a very good expert team of researchers and practitioners who are responsible for managing the large carnivores and um, also managing the large carnivore kills. Um, so first of all, usually we gain information about the carcass of wildlife or livestock. Um, it can be done by, by cell phone or by email. Then um, some of our experts or um, game wardeners go out and um, check um, the kill and collect the data at the site. And uh, they fill in a um, um, field form, of course, uh, take pictures, take measurements um, of the surrounding area also, and take genetic samples in most of the cases. Um, back at the office, um, the data will be processed and um, put into, inserted into database. And also, we, if we have a livestock um, kill, um, there most in the, of the cases autopsy is done by the State in Institute for Chemical and Veterinary Analysis. Um, and we also send the genetic samples to the Senckenberg Institute and they do um, a research and um, check for the um, reason or for the cause of the kill. And with all this uh, data we obtain, we can um, most of the time we um, can uh, say if a large carnival was involved in this kill or not. And But um, as you can see, the highlighted boxes, the screen highlighted boxes, um, Bettina, autopsy or... Bettina, sorry. Yes. Uh, uh, we, we are not uh, seeing your your slides. Oh. We, we got the first one, so... Oh, my God. There is a... Uh, a technical issue on our side or on yours? Can you see now? Oh, yeah, perfect. <laughs> <Thank> oh. <you. laughs> oh, okay. Um, 
I just I, I hope you can follow my my talk because yeah just I, I was just uh, explaining a little bit of um, the process um, if we get information on uh, a live killed livestock or animal and um, so most of the time um, actually um, as you see here in this highlighted boxes um, the autopsy on genetics is mainly done if a large carnivore is suspected suspected to uh, have caused the kill but um, in many other cases um, the death of the animal remains uncertain and cannot be retraced anymore and therefore we started a research project on the dis dis distinctive on um, the identification of carcass used by predators and mammalian scavengers and the distinctiveness to the previous shown processing steps is that um, this project includes also the analysis of kills without obvious indication on, on large carnivores. Um, the, my project partner, Jan Seger, who is, uh, will carry out the project uh, together with me is part of the monitoring team. So he has very good skills and uh, yeah, large carnivore kill and identifications. Uh, goal of uh, the project will be to, um, um, yeah, the, the potentials and to, to estimate or to figure out the potentials and the limiting factors of the species identification and also of evaluation and information transfer to the stakeholders. And we also want to improve the knowledge transfer um, from the research center to the different uh, groups of stakeholders, for example, to farmers and to hunters. Um, and as was mentioned in the previous uh, talk, we also want to um, enhance acceptance of the research at the general public, because this um, also seems to be a problem still. Um, nevertheless, there are some challenges that we need to deal with. Um, there are highly emotional stakeholders, um, and especially if the livestock was killed, of course, and, and because of death by stakeholders, we already heard that before. Um, and the reliable estimation of cause of death requires very good data communication. And to face these challenges, we um, and to achieve the uh, the research goals the best way possible, we chose to combine um, two different approaches. On the one hand, uh, by collecting the data on pa pathomorphological feeding traits and bite marks. And therefore, we developed a standardized protocol with two levels. Um, on the first level, we um, want to gain general data on the carcass. And on the second level, we want to collect data on specific details of morphological characteristics at the feeding spot. Um, and in addition, uh, we want to do um, yeah, genetic identification um, with the uh, help of uh, uh, samples at the bite marks and at the feeding spots. And therefore we take several um, samples at one feeding spot at different places, which are also uh, standardized and on the field protocol. Uh, now to gain a closer look at the genetic method, we chose, um, I prepared um, flow chart and um, we chose a two-sided sample uh, analysis. On the one hand, um, we um, chose for amplifications of um, the uh, WD loop. This is um, a fragment that um, amplifies a special um, mtDNA fragment and um, give, yeah, can, can give distinction between uh, dog and wolf. And on the other hand, we chose um, for um, primer for a fragment of um, which is um, yeah am can amplify several mammal species. 
So um, to this, we also add a blocking prime, blocking oligonucleotide, uh, because we wanted uh, to impede the amplification of the prey species. Uh, then we do um, agarose gel and um, select samples for further analysis. Um, we want to analyze the DNA by Sanger sequencing and then match our sequences with reference data. Um, to now I want to uh, give you a little bit more explanation on um, this amplification with the oligonucleotide we chose. Um, yes, for those who are not exactly into this topic, um, the uh, a blocker oligonucleotide is um, lacking a hydroxy group at the three uh, a three space um, end, and therefore it um, yeah it um, inhibits the polymerase elongation and therefore um, a particular DNA fragment is not able to be um, to be amplified and we figured out um, at the end of, a, of this particular uh, DNA fragment um, that the carnivore species or um, predator and scavenger species are um, Re really distinctive from um, prey species. So we designed a blocking primer with that fit on the um, road deer. And it also fits at this part of the fragment for um, red deer and sheep. And um, this worked very well. Um, I can show you some First genetic results we achieved. Um, here you see uh, agarose gel with uh, where we mixed up roe deer and fox DNA and in different uh, mixtures. And we achieved um, by this blocking that uh, fox DNA is amplified, but um, roe deer DNA is successfully um, blocked so that we can, even if uh, raw DNA is 100 times more abundant than fox DNA, we can uh, figure out the fox. Um, however, the project just started only in September. Um, there's a plenty of work to do. So um, we are not busy with the validation of the field form. Um, we want to um, start assembling at the beginning of next year. And uh, we need to build up a reference database for alignment of the species identification. And especially um, we need more reference data on different haplotypes of wolf and dogs. Um, and yeah, we um, hopefully then we can uh, do a good data analysis on sufficient data and um, combine the two approaches. And in the end, uh, yeah, we hope we can achieve some of our research goals mentioned in the beginning. And with this, I'm at the end of my presentation. I, sorry for the problems in the beginning. I hope you could follow. Thank you very much. And here I have some, uh, some more information if you want, uh, if you need uh, interest in more information on Wolf and Links in Germany, I have some more links for further information for you. Okay, thank you, Bettina. Uh, now we have uh, five minutes for questions. I remember there was one from Joaquin. Raquel, please. Yes, it was actually related to the use of blocking uh, You So uh, if you have about 70,000 reads, how, what percentage of this is from your uh, prey species and, and how many reads do you end up having from your, from your predators? Uh, so uh, on average, uh, we have 10,000 reads from the predator. More because I think this is 
because and we don't use blocking primers. This was a strategy because there are several preys and we want to confirm the prey as well. Uh, so we decided not to use blocking primers and actually it works uh, well for most of the samples. Um, uh, and I think this is the way to collect the sample. But they have specific instructions to go only to that site and, and, and collect. And then we kill, even if you, they, they collect the air, we, we clean uh, in the lab uh, yeah. but for, everything before extraction. On a sheep, the kill bite is typically very clear, but on, a, on, a, on cattle, this is very often just somewhere in the in the in the hind legs, or uh, we yeah. do we rarely see actually that they are have a throat throat bite on on cattle. It's just they start munching on on, on cows that that uh, <laughs> just are exhausted. Well, yeah, but that I cannot reply you because I'm not doing the field work. So. Uh, what I can say here is that the rangers are doing it very, very efficiently. Okay. They have high accuracy identifying, and uh, it's very curious to 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 know that some of these dogs that we identified as dogs, they actually uh, did not. They said that it was a canid. They did not. Uh, uh, This is for uh, dogs, and they are not in those cases. Thank you. I didn't say, but I might say now that uh, uh, we do two replicates always to extractions and to DNA library preps and, and to sequencing. And if we have 10,000 reads from in one replicate, but not the same quantity or only 100 on the other replicate, we do not consider uh, that sample. And this is part of our fails. Is that because the two replicates are not uh, giving the same result and we prefer to discard than to assume that something happened in the replicate that is not giving the, the, the wolf DNA. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, if the, there are no more questions, we, we go on with the next, next uh, section. Uh, we'll be focused on monitoring and population estimation, and we'll have uh, the opportunity to, to have with us uh, Paulo Celio uh, from CBO, University of Porto, Ruben Joseph from the Conservation Carpathia Foundation, and Karsten Novak uh, from Senckenberg Society for, for Nature. So, Paolo, welcome. Your presentation here? Yeah. Alves, Special Alves. Uh, uh, that one. Uh, yeah. Uh, the opening. No, I need to talk from here. Yeah. Uh, you can stand up, but you will have to take the Okay, okay. No, I can, I can so, do it. Okay. So first, we're going to share screen. Yeah. And then oh. I'm going to. No, I can talk from here. Yeah. I'm going to put the presentation. Okay, that's it. Hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, thanks for the invitation for uh, WWF and, and GVAC. It's a great pleasure to, to, to be here presenting uh, our work and also participating in this very uh, nice uh, workshop for uh, a uh, really important topic and also nice to see good friends. So what I'm going to talk is about the monitoring um, anthropogenic uh, hybridization and I will try to explain why, how and when uh, we should do that. 
first of all, let's start to, to, to talk or to say something about this, in fact, hybridization. So hybridization is the interbreeding of individuals from genetically distinct populations, regardless their taxonomic status of populations. Uh, uh, and we can have what we call the interspecific hybridization. So this means that the, the parental individuals that are interbreeding are belong to the same subpopulation from the from the same subspecies, or, or this means that from the same species, but we also can have interbreeding from different species. So this is interspecific hybridization. And in fact, the hybridization is 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 it was quite common and also kind of uh, 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 fact that people uh, usually try an, ex an experience to interbreed uh, several animals uh, 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 and gain uh, weird animals, mainly this artificial hybridization. But usually all these hybrids were considered uh, unfertile. And in fact, for a long time, hybridization was considered the kind of evolutionary dead end. So that was no further let's say, evolutionary consequence of hybridization. And there was nice experience, nice. I don't know if it is nice, this is almost playing, that making uh, st strange animals like uh, a, a liger, that is a male lion with a female tiger, a tiger and is a male tiger with a female lion and, and leopard and so on. But in fact, what are the causes of hybridization? So we have first, what I call the natural hybridization, that is basically natural species or natural populations that are having secondary contact, that they are now in contact. They were, let's say, separated, and now they are uh, in contact due, for instance, rapid expansions from, this, from, from the populations uh, and adaptive radiations, and sometimes uh, this, this, this expansion, these movements are due to climate change. I here put climate change is long time climate is, uh, oscillations because uh, we know that the climate is always changing. It's not only now that it changes, but I'm blogging long term. Uh, hybrid speciations and ancestral integration. So there is a lot of cases of uh, uh, the so called natural hybridization. But there, are, but there is also what is the anthropogenic hybridization. And what is anthropogenic hybridization? Anthropogenic hybridization is produced by producers or induced by, by humans. As I show you that the examples before, that strange animals, these were basically produced by women. The women the just decided to interbreed different species. So this is completely artificial. But there are, that could also be that case of induced by introducing species, species that are introduced uh, in some areas. For instance, here in Iberian Peninsula, we have the case of the, 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 the sugar partridges, uh, partridges from, 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 from uh, uh, Turkey and Greece that was introduced uh, in, in, in Iberian Peninsula and is interbreeding with the, the, the red like partridges. But there are also cases of domestic, the, the, domestic, the domestic animals that they are being now uh, interbreeding with their uh, uh, um, well, the, the wild counterpart, with, the, with the, the wild animals. And habitat change and also climate change can also, inter, can also provoke the anthropogenic hybridization. So let's let's ex give an example, and I will give an example with a species that is quite common here in the Iberian Peninsula and, 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 and important, but also everywhere in the world. There is this is a, a rabbit that the rabbit that inhabits only in the Iberian Peninsula is in southern and southwest Iberian Peninsula. I call it the Iberian wild rabbit. It is a subspecies or a species that is Oricolagus algirus, but we also have the European. Uh, wild rabbit that is this is also inhabiting Iberian Peninsula in, in the northwest, in our nor northeast, sorry, and also that was the rabbit that was introduced in several other areas, like in, in Britain, in Australia, and, and all over the world. 
And we also have the domestic rabbit. And what is the domestic rabbit? The domestic rabbit was domesticated, not from the Oritolagos algiers, but was domesticated from the Oritolagos conicos. So what can happen here? In fact, here is a very curious system that we can have. The natural hybridization, the hybridization between the Oritolagos algiers and the Oritolagos conicos. I'm talking about natural population. And this is what is happening naturally in the contact zone in the Iberian Peninsula, but we also can have the hybridization between the Algiers and the Cunicus with the domestic rabbits, which is the anthropogenic uh, hybridization. And what is this, 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 this is a problem. Let's have a look on what we do when we domesticate species. And usually we can have, let's say, Major three major outputs in domestication. Let's start here with the neutrality. So we have the wild populations, and the colors here means alleles, diversity. We have the bottleneck because we select some any animals for 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 turning them domestic. But it could be just by neutrality that what we gain as a, a domestic species is basically a representation of what we have, and basically we have the the similar representations about genetic diversity what uh, in the in the domestic species that we found in the wild species but if we make a selection if we usually this is what we do when we domesticate the species what is what the man has done in the past but also still doing we select some characteristics and for instance here here we select the red means that we will only have animals that have the red allele or mostly the red allele and this means that we are provoking a loss of genetic diversity but it is curious that sometimes we in the domestication can be doing the others the other way around this means that a wild the wild population is usually is, is doesn't have a lot of uh, genetic diversity but there is a kind of relaxations or uh, protections of some characteristics that in the wild it was impossible to survive but we are protecting and means that it ends up that the domestic animals have much uh, higher diversity not much but higher genetic diversity than the the domestic uh, that the wild species okay so uh what this can provoke in, 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 in the hybridization. So hybridization can increase or decrease or have no effect in the, in the thickness. But we should highlight that usually if we are hybridizing uh, uh, populations, doesn't need to be species, but populations that are already far away in terms of evolution, they are already different evolutionary uh, units or subspecies or species, usually we have problems, what we call the outbreeding depressions. We can have what we call intrinsic, that is already uh, uh, interference in uh, genetic or chromosome interactions that make that it is impossible, or either the, 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 the offspring doesn't survive or it will be inferred or, or it does less likelihood of uh, surviving, but we also have extrinsic that even if we born, it will not survive depending on an environment. But of course, there are, let's say, positive cases and, and, and we have heard that the hybrid, because genetic diversity overall is, is also important and there is the kind of hybrid vigor, the heterosis, that in some way it can also be beneficial. Uh, uh, let's talk about two cases that probably it is the cases that we are talking more here about the hybridizations in the domestic cat and the wild cat and the dogs that we were just also, I think, uh, discussing here. And in fact, there is a problem because in cats, the domestic cat was domesticated not from the species that is inhabiting Europe. It was a next species that was uh, Pelis livica uh, that was in, 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 in East uh, uh, part of Europe and also in, 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 in Africa in, in, in the uh, and, uh, uh, and in fact 
the domestication, of course, uh, will be with a completely different, uh, let's say, animal in some way. And, and it, is, it is becoming, and also the domestication that we, when we domesticate animals, mainly dogs and cats, we are selecting characteristics like having the animal less, uh, more tamed, uh, uh, the animal that behave uh, in, the, in the way that is uh, uh, more adapt to humans, it breeds, uh, let's say the breeding size is, is, is bigger and so on, so characteristics that in some way are not the ones that we found in in the wild and the overall consequences of this hybridization it will be a major uh, uh, conservation concern and we can discuss this more later uh, uh, so but another thing that i would like to tell you is that some cases the detection of hybrids is really really difficult why because the morphological characteristics are generally difficult and this is happening mainly on on on, on the on the on the cats, not that much on on, on the wolves and dogs, um, because sometimes the hybrid just have a kind of mosaic, a mixture of the the, the parental phenotypes, and it could be let's say difficult. Sometimes there are kind of hybrid swarms that some characteristics are prevalent that are more present, uh, and and this and make them impossible to distinguish between the, the parental uh, taxon. And, uh, and, uh, and also sometimes even it is uh, easy to, to, do, to, to distinguish or to identify uh, an hybrid, but usually they have one. When we have back cross, it becomes a real problem. And, uh, uh, and the hybridization is in fact uh, a, a problem in, in, in some species. I will present here the case of the, the wild and domestic uh, uh, cat. This is just a review that was published recently. And we have here, here a variety uh, of, of uh, rates of, of, of hybridization all over Europe. We have, for instance, in Germany that we only have 3% of, of hybridization. Uh, uh, and I've been in Peninsula 21% of hybridization, but we have cases, for instance, in Scotland that we have 100%. That means there is no more wildcats in, 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 in Scotland. This means that is a variation. Uh, some countries are lower than others, but overall here we have a problem. And just have, this is, you can also see this paper and you have here where the populations are, have, are found in the hybrids, and we also can see here that most of the hybrids in the Iberian Peninsula are found in southern uh, uh, Iberia. Uh, how we can do, how we can promote, how we can monitor the anthropogenic hybridization? We can use the molecular markers. We have been here already discussing here, uh, and we learn about uh, about this uh, this morning. So we can because they are more accurate. They can allow the detection of hybrids between individuals that even have a very shallow genetic differentiation. It is a case of wild and domestic, because don't remember that the domestic, before being domesticated, was a, a wild animal. So, uh, and, and this is what, uh, there, so there is a shallow uh, uh, differentiation, but we can do, we can have good results using genetics. <laughs> And even we can uh, we can uh, optimize markers that can be used using genetic non-invasive samples, but and also we can do this in using a small percentage. I think there is something uh, not uh, this bar is. I don't know if I can. Okay. Can I? Because I don't. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. But I would like to show you this, otherwise you don't see. I will move. Okay, so you can do this using, let's say, uh, SNPs or microsatellites, but we also can do this, okay, using a uh, uh, more a genomic approach. You can assess the, the hybridization with the reduced genomic representation like RATSEC, or you can use 
uh, all genome. So what I'm showing here, this is a, there is several ways of doing this. So, uh, you have here, here today genomics, sometimes you have some markers. So this is a kind of quantity of, of genetic information, but we can, let's, what, what, what I really like to say that we have different tools and diff, of course, as more genomic information we have better, we can also do a lot of things as we learn also with the meta barcoding with just a few set of markers. Sorry about this. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, we, we, the, the optimization of these markers can allow us for, to do this uh, I would say in real time, let's say if we optimize set of markers, if we have a good reference, we can just basically do this a uh, real time assessment of hybridization. And this is a paper that was uh, done by my colleague Raquel, Raquel uh, in, 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 Northern, in Northern Spain, where they detected uh, 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 an hybrid uh, uh, population and uh, they were able basically collecting feces to follow the hybrids, know how many, who they are, were the parents and so on. And basically they were, basic, uh, were doing this basically online. And what is interesting to see is that they were also able to demonstrate that uh, a, 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 represent, a, a few set of microsatellites, that is a quite the easiest and the simplest uh, technique, like 13 loci, were enough to characterize, uh, uh, to detect, sorry, the hybrids. As you can see here, the, the colors of this, this is, got, is, a, is, is quite simple to interpret, I think. You have here two colors. The, the gray is dogs, the black are wolves. And here you see the Sierra de Barbanza, where they found the hybrids. You, have, you can see here that you have animals that are basically dogs and animals that you have, the bar is half gray, half black beans that these individuals are hybrids. And this means that we have tools to do the monitoring uh, genetic diversity, the, sorry, the, the diversification, and we can do it in real time. And we really need to do that. And this is what I would like to see this implemented in, in for conservation of the uh, several species. Thank you for your attention. Obrigado, Paulo. Thank you very much. Uh, our next uh, guest is Karsten Novak, but um, he may be finding some. Ah, your first. Okay, okay, okay. So, okay. Okay, so I will put your presentation. That is. Uh, Okay, so we welcome Ruben Yosef. I'm going to share screen. Yeah, I'll do the because it's already. Yeah, let's change the slide. Okay, and then you can. The screen? Yeah. Okay. Ruben, floor is yours. Hi everyone, my name is Ruben. I'm working at the Foundation Conservation Carpathia in, in Southern Carpathia, Romania. And together with uh, colleagues from uh, University of Ljubljana, we built um, a, mon a long-term monitoring scheme uh, for, for large carnivores in, in, uh, in the Romanian Carpathians. But uh, I'm going to speak today about challenges of studying brown bears with genetics because of the time constraints. But uh, we hope at a later date we can talk more about uh, monitoring of wolves and lynx as well. So about the, um, uh, just a few words about the context of uh, monitoring and management brown bears in the, in the Romanian Carpathians. 
in October 2016, the government banned trophy hunting. Uh, that moment was an opportunity, but also an obligation uh, for Romania to, to switch from a traditional uh, monitoring to uh, um, modern monitoring that should be based on scientific data. Uh, the, what was the, the actual reason for the government to ban the trophy hunting of, of large carnivores back then? Uh, for, well, the first reason was that the, the, um, the officially reported data was documented to be uh, unrealistic. And that happened especially for brown bear. If you look at, at the graph over there, you see the, uh, the, the black line is the population growth as uh, officially uh, reported by, by uh, the authorities in Romania compared to the growth rates of, uh, um, of population of brown bears across uh, the species range. You see that the, the, the um, uh, estimates for, for the wolf were much, uh, much better, but in the case of the brown bear, which is an economically important, used to be an economically important species, the estimates were um, yeah, totally out of, out of bounds. Um, well, after, after five years or six years since, since that moment, uh, the things uh, di didn't advance mat, uh, much. Um, we still don't know if the population increased. There are uh, strong voices out there, especially in the, in, you know, in the public, in the media, that says that the population, since the hunting ban, the population increased exponentially year by year. And, and they also say that the, the, the only explanation for conflict is, is the number of, uh, is, is this increase in the number of bears. The truth is, we don't know if the number of bears actually increased, and we also don't know if the, the only explanation for conflicts is this possible increase in the, in the brown bear numbers. That's why uh, in, uh, in 2017, uh, we uh, started this monitoring scheme uh, in, in Southern Carpathians, and the questions we would try to, to, to ask there, the first one is, what is the population size and density of brown bears? So the goal is to develop, was to develop a, a, replica, a functional and replicable monitoring scheme. Uh, the second question we try to ask, how big is the magnitude of problematic bears in, in, uh, in the population? We do have a problem with conflicts uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the project area. So yeah, developing a tool for uh, damage uh, bear identification was very important for us. And the third question, so the first two questions we are the answer and see the, the results today. But the third question is, uh, is something that is planned for 2022. Uh, after exact five years since the first genetic census, we will go back with the same resources in the same place to, to count the bears again and see if, if uh, the population, how, how, the, how fast the population is going up or down. Uh, about the methods, uh, a brief description of the monitoring area, as you can see, is located in, in the middle of the Carpathian Arch. Uh, it has 1,200 square kilometers. It, the size of the area is large enough to be relevant for, for the species uh, movement capacity. But if you look at the, at the Romanian map, you see the study area is located right in the middle. So a level of edge effect when modeling population estimates is expected, uh, especially because we don't have any strong barriers to bear movement uh, outside of the of the study area. And I have a picture, okay, it includes a small national park and uh, several other Natura 2000 sites of community importance. And I have these pictures of the study area for you to understand the context. You see in the background, uh, you see the high mountains with compact forest stands, but in, the, in, in front you see a mosaic of uh, hay fields, uh, crops to a less extent, uh, orchards as well but with significant areas of natural vegetation. And you see these green lines going deep to the, you know, to the heart of the villages. And that's uh, usually used as escape routes for, for the problematic bears uh, during their attack the village at, at night. So the context is uh, again, very complex and um, uh, it's uh, yeah, allowing for, for many conflicts there. A few words about the, um, uh, the genetic uh, work that we did. Uh, so in um, uh, autumn 2017 and in autumn 2018, we did this full genetic census. We collected around 700 uh, non-invasive DNA samples uh, in each of these uh, monitoring sessions. Uh, we used the classic MAR recapture approach to do population estimates. Why, the, why classic and not spatial explicit capture MAR recapture approach? It was very difficult for us to trace the, the effort of each team in the field. Why? Besides our own um, monitoring team, we also get help from 
uh, like collaborators, external collaborators like park rangers or uh, even local hunters sometimes help us to collect samples. Um, uh, and also some volunteers and they uh, so the, the um, uh, systematic monitoring team collected like 60% of the uh, of the data, but the rest the external collaborators also collected a significant amount in, so that's why uh, we eventually decided to, to do classic Mari capture approach. And since uh, after uh, identifying all the bears in our population, we did continuous uh, uh, identification of the problem bears at the uh, livestock attacks that happened in the village. So we focused only on livestock attacks and only inside uh, inside the villages. About the genetic protocols that we used, uh, I'm not going into great details. Uh, you probably know the, the protocols on large carnivores described by the Barba and collaborators. Um, we used uh, 13 microsatellite loss to, to uh, and one ID, uh, uh, sex identification locus to, to reconstruct our genotypes. And the results, uh, so yeah, uh, looking first at the genotyping success, I mean, if you uh, see, I mean, the, the difference between uh, the, um, the ratio between the scat samples and hair samples, it's, uh, of course, we collected more scat, but also quite a high proportion of hair as well. Uh, the genotyping success for hair samples is good, around 70%, but also constant. Uh, so on the left side, I have the uh, first year, and on the right side, I have the results for the, for the second year. You see here that the genotyping success is constant between the two years, but if you look at the scats, uh, the um, uh, genotyping success uh, went down from 63 to 54%. Uh, we'll talk later on about, about this. If you look at the identified genotypes, uh, yeah, okay. In total, across the, both sampling sessions, we identified 283 uh, individual bears in, in our population. Uh, if you look at the males, that's rather constant between the two years, but the females, uh, as the genotyping success dropped for scat, the, the, the um, number of females also dropped. Uh, an interesting property of, of, uh, of, of our study is that the overlap uh, of the genotypes between the first and the second year is only 33%. Uh, it is 47 uh, overlap in case of males and 18% in the case of females. I found it small for, for both sexes. Uh, it happened probably uh, for, for two reasons. The area is uh, in the middle of the Carpathian, in, in a well connected with, with the rest of the population from outside. But it might be also because of the uh, low detectability of females because of that uh, low genotype, lower genotyping success uh, of scas. And uh, I'll just briefly show you this map with the genotypes. So yeah, another challenge that you notice on the, on the map is it was difficult for us to cover the whole area uh, evenly. An area in the south, we, we sampled with less intensity compared to, to area in the north. So we eventually, the models, the, the statistical part, we did it from a subset of the samples that 900 square kilometers area in the north that we consider it's uh, uh, evenly um, uh, sampled in, in both years. But uh, I go back now about uh, um, the difference between uh, uh, males and females. Uh, so in blue on these plots, I have uh, males and in red, I have females and the two years um, uh, aside. If you look at the males, you see that after three months of sampling, the, uh, the, the genotypes reach the asymptote. So you no longer find many new individuals, many new uh, males in, in, in our population. But if you look at the females, you see that after three months of sampling, you still get new females into your monitoring system. And if you compare 2017 and 2018, you see um, while the males are, have comparable detection rates, the female got uh, lower detection rates in the second year. And the explanation we found is, I'm not sure you, you can see it, but I think I can move the bar. Ooh. Okay. So males have higher detection probability at drop trees. So the higher um, amount of uh, hair samples you get, the higher bias is uh, towards males. And uh, the conclusion we, uh, we got is focus on scats. Scats represents the population much better for capture more recapture modeling. But again, that's another challenge, but because for scats, you, you can get uh, yeah, lower uh, genotyping success. Okay. 
Just a few words about the abundance models. Anyway, we used, I'm not going to, yeah, to describe each one. Uh, we used a, a variety of, of uh, uh, classic Mori capture models for estimating the abundance. But what I will show you here is just that, yeah, as, as you've seen uh, earlier on, um, uh, on the plots, uh, I mean, the robustness of the prediction of males is, is, is decent for, and um, is decent and, and comparable between the two years for males. But for females, you see in the second year uh, an, an increase in the confidence interval, and that also drives the, the confidence interval and the robustness of the prediction for, for the all population size in the second year. Uh, we, as I mentioned in the first slide, we were very interested to uh, evaluate density of bears. Um, a piece of information very important for us to, to make decision uh, at, at the ground level. Uh, so we did that by um, estimating the effective sampling area using the MMDM approach. Um, that means the, the mean um, daily distance moved. And this distance, we estimated it by, the, by looking at the sample revealed movement separately for males and females. And we got, um, uh, through these uh, corrections, we got a density of 17, 18 bears per 100 square kilometers. That's three, four times higher than, uh, than populations in the, um, Southern Europe, for example, in Greece or, or in uh, Italian population. Uh, but it's comparable to, to densities uh, in, in North America, for example, on Grizzly. Uh, also, yeah, comparable to, to Croatia and Slovenia. I, I remember they, they got even higher densities in, in uh, Croatia and Slovenia at some certain points. And uh, another interesting result that we got uh, if the number of observed uh, animals was skewed towards uh, males, the, the statistical estimate says that we actually have more females in, in the population. And you see we got seven males per 100 square kilometers reported to 11 uh, females per 100 square kilometers you see in the, in the table below. And just one, uh, yeah, one slide about uh, damage pair identification. Uh, after we genotype the, the, the entire population in the project area, we continued for, for three years with uh, collecting um, uh, usually hair samples in broken fences or broken stables or broken animal shelters. And we collected around 100 samples from, from these attacks in the villages and identified 28 problematic bears. 19 of them were males and nine and females. But the challenge is to, to define actually what is a problematic bear because the number of attacks per bear varied a lot with many of the individuals having only one uh, attack while others have up to 13 successful attacks in the villages. Uh, anyway, this, how, uh, this is how the genotypes of the, the, the recaptures of the so-called problematic uh, individuals look on the map. Uh, the data is already helping us to, to derive and to, and to draw on the maps uh, this, this type of uh, virtual fences alerts. We have you know, five colors that we'll put on, on animals in, in our life project next year. So we already we start now to, to, to make decisions on, uh, on, uh, in the field uh, based on, on this data set. Another example is that um, we... Uh, four years ago, I think we relocated one uh, individual bear, and through genetics, we uh, eventually noticed that the bear returned to the, the same village and did attack, continued to do attacks there. And we eventually shot that bear, extracted it, and also through genetics, we identified it as, a, as the relocated bear. So this type of data is not solving the conflict entirely, but at least it helps us to, to, to get an idea of the magnitude of the problem uh, over there. And just, yeah, as a conclusion slide, uh, the challenges that we encounter during our studies, the first one is focus on scat rather than hair from rock trees, especially if the rock trees are located around the supplementary feeding points. You, you probably know that in Eastern Europe, feeding, uh, feeding scheme is a big thing for, for, for wildlife. And if you focus over there, you probably get uh, um, just a part of the full uh, population, you know. Um, Increase the sampling area to deal with the edge effect. That's very important. And uh, yeah, try to do a constant sampling effort in space to get robust population estimates. And if possible, with increasing the sampling area, also try to, to, to track the effort and, um, 
and run actually spatial explicit capture recapture, which we did for, for links with camera trapping data, it eventually provided better results than classic Mari capture in, in, in the same study area. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robin, for this very interesting uh, presentation. And then uh, we have with us um, Karsten Novak. Uh, Karsten, when you want. Great, thank you. Hope you can hear me. Yeah, perfect. Wonderful. Yeah, thanks for, for inviting me. Um, I will present you in the next few minutes the situation of genetic monitoring of uh, recolonizing carnivores in Germany. So we're in Central Europe now. We have a situation that a lot of wildlife has been extinct, eradicated in the past uh, decades and centuries. And now species like lynx, wolf, uh, bear not so much, but a uh, wildcat, for instance, uh, to a certain degree, also moose and some other species are returning or becoming more abund abundant um, in, the, in the densely populated um, um, regions in, in Germany, even, which is quite interesting to follow that. And um, yeah, just to introduce Senckenberg, the institution I work is Senckenberg is distributed across Germany. It's a, a uh, its main center, Natural History Museum in Frankfurt. This is a species here, a large predator, not so abundant anymore, fortunately, in Germany. And I work at Field Station, uh, where we have a bit east of Frankfurt here in central Germany, where um, we host the Center for Wildlife Genetics. And um, what we are doing, we are analyzing roughly 10,000 samples per year uh, in the frame of research, uh, citizen science, and uh, large scale national and international monitoring activities. We work on certain species, mainly on wolf, lynx, European wildcat, but also on bears, otters, beavers, dormice, common hamster, uh, bison, and red deer to a, to a lower degree. And we do aquatic eDNA, for instance. And um, I will focus on two examples. The first one is the European wildcat. You, I think you already heard about European wildcat today. Um, and to briefly show that, that's the situation kind of before genetic monitoring was launched around the time 2007. So wildcat was distributed in the central German mountain range region in the southwest, in the central part to isolate its small population. They were considered highly fragmented. They only survived, by the way, the main bottleneck um, in uh, uh, a few known refugia, it's not so sure actually. And it was known that it's slowly expanding the wildcat population and uh, it was considered rare and only locally present and an urgent need of connectivity measures um, because forest regions uh, where wildcats live mainly were, uh, are fragmented. And around that time, some uh, people found out that if you have these simple wooden poles there and place them in the landscape during the winter time, the rep reproduction period, um, or the mating period, I'm sorry, um, and you, you treat them with the uh, Valeriana officinalis um, um, root extracts, this will lure the wildcats and they will leave hairs. So what we did, we started to establish um, the genetic analysis, microsatellite anal analysis, sequencing of mtDNA at that time, and we just analyzed it together with a lot of different people and projects and conservationists and NGOs like Friends of the Earth Germany. And uh, here is the result of the first about 6,000 analysis until 2013. And we, we were surprised that half of these detections of wildcat were outside the known area. And this uh, changed the known distribution a lot. This is a more current one. It's spreading quite fast to the north, to the east, to the south in the moment. So it's not current anymore, but it's much larger now. And then what we did with, a, with an NGO, with the Friends of the Earth Germany, the BOND, is a large scale systematic hair trapping. A hair trapping in reference grids. And uh, these grids contain um, um, these, these hair traps here and with citizen scientists, um, um, it can be kids, it can be volunteers, anything, 
Um, in total, 23,000 controls were done, nearly 3,000 samples were collected, and in total, it was nearly 2,000 wildcat detections with 500 wildcat individuals. And here you see some rough densities, um, um, red is higher densities and lower densities uh, here in areas where the species is only, only recently occupied. So that showed us as a pilot project, hey, we can do systematic assessments uh, uh, across the entire country or distribution of the species. This is how a plot looks like in Heinich National Park in central Germany. Um, and you see in blue the females and in red the males detected with uh, genetic fingerprints with microsatellites. Um, yeah, and at that time, this was quite a new um, thing to be able to really check how many animals are there without going into detail. This is results we have for a few days only. This is the results of national wildcat census done in the frame of the EU directive monitoring. This will be repeated like every six years to report to the EU. And it, it's in 13 plots. It's a more systematic uh, assessment than I showed before. And you see wildcat densities here. Um, and hybridization assessment, population structure, genetic diversity in 13 different plots, actually, um, and also inbreeding. Yeah? And uh, this gave us 2,069 hair samples um, and resulted in the detection, I don't know the exact number now, in several hundreds of wildcat. What we are doing, we switched from microsatellites to SNPs. And we don't do high throughput sequencing, but we have a panel I showed in a moment of 96 SNPs for individual identification um, mainly. And then if, if the assignment to wild or domestic cat is not working properly, so you assume it might be a hybrid and a mixed animal, there is a second panel of 96 SNPs that is used for hybrid detection. So to switch from the microsatellites, which have some problems sometimes in particular to hybrid detection, um, to the SNPs. And we are working towards a replication-free way to analyze them, uh, which is just cheaper and faster to do. So this is, again, the panel that we are using. We are developing quite a lot of uh, SNP panels for different European uh, wildlife species, but this one has been done. It was the first one actually around uh, that Beatrice Nussberger developed and published in, in two papers in 2013 and 14. Um, and uh, Beatrice, she picked from a subset of sequenced wild and domestic cats those SNPs, so those mutations um, um, in the genome that differentiate wild from domestic cats. And if you have heterozygous markers, you have a high chance that you have a hybrid. And you can analyze up to 96 samples in such an array, such a chip. And those are the assays. And basically, it's like a real-time PCR-based species detection, but it's in micro microfluidic channels. So the assays, it's nine, up to 96 assays, so SNPs. Um, and 96 samples are combined in one reaction and within a few hours you have all those results and you can analyze like a thousand samples in a week, for instance, um, roughly with that approach and it establishes more and more. And uh, also the one big advantage is that this method can be used anywhere. It works with wildcats in Portugal, in Spain, the same with wildcats in, in, uh, in Germany or in uh, Romanian Carpathians, for instance. Yeah, you can easily put the data together and compare them directly, which is a major advantage. Um, this is one example that we published in 2018, um, an assessment of roughly 500, uh, at this time, roadkill samples mainly, but it works as well for non-invasive, for hair samples. Yeah? It's the best way so far probably to have SNPs running in non-invasive samples like uh, uh, hairs from hair traps. So these are wildcats. This is an assignment uh, with the program New Hybrids. Blue is wildcat. These are different hybrid classes. There were a few hybrids, but about 3% of the samples were F1 hybrids, second generation hybrids, or back crosses mostly to the wildcat. So if a hybrid uh, hybridizes with a um, pure wildcat, um, and of course you have domestic cats. So we have really low um, amount of hybrids in Germany. We know there are regions with severely increased hybridization now locally, but in most of the, um, of the population, especially in the strongholds of the population, in the densely forested 
um, uh, connected large mountain ranges, low mountain ranges of central Germany, you have really difficulties to find a hybrid. So the hybridization rate in these areas is far below 1%. You very often, if you do a project, uh, uh, even with many samples, you find no single hybrid, not a single backcross. Um, but and, and there are domestic cats out there. So if you have large forests, um, you probably have no hybrid hybridization problem. And this is an example from Europe. We tested also the system for the first time in Europe. Um, and uh, a similar pattern you have like in Spain, in the south, in the more Mediterranean shrubland regions and mountain regions, you have quite some hybrids in some places. In the north, in the more forested areas, you don't find too many hybrids. And this is well known. You have a complete hybrid swarm with zero pure, basically zero pure wildcats in Scotland. In most other regions, like here in the Carpathians, hybrids are an in, in exception, actually. One thing to be mentioned is that um, if you design the SNP panels, you can just pick whatever you need. And this is what we are doing. Like we need about 40 SNPs to differentiate between individuals. You can have like 24 SNPs for hybrid assessment, which allows to assess the first two hybrid generations. Otherwise, you need more. You can put some for sex, for population differentiation, whatever you want. Yeah. Um, so this is like a, a um, like a good way to to somehow design a panel that fulfills your needs and only provides the information that you want. This is our approach. Um, very briefly, only we do some Eurasian links monitoring as well and so. Research. For instance, we focus on genome-wide assessment uh, using whole genome or uh, a red seq genome-wide SNP data to assess, for instance, the genome-wide inbreeding level, which is much higher in reintroduced links than in native populations across Eurasia. So for some questions, you definitely uh, uh, need to step away from non-invasive samples, from microsatellite or these small reduced SNP panels to genome-wide more complex uh, measures that require also more complex bioinformatic analysis. My final example is the wolf. The wolf returned to Germany in the late 90s. The first pack was here at the eastern tip of Germany at the Polish border in the Lausitz uh, uh, area. And uh, since then, this is data from the last monitoring year. Um, we have more than 150 wolf territories. And um, so now it, it, it will even be more. So the wolf is rapidly spreading, especially in this northeastern European lowlands. So in blue, you have packs, then you have pairs in red. Um, and we have different marker systems that we apply in the frame of the national monitoring. There is a national monitoring and the federal, the, so the regions, the federal states, um, they collect the samples and they provide us samples and we analyze them and, and have an automatic database system where also the, the results are placed and they get the results in, in like real time. It's quite a challenge actually, because we are expected to provide results very, very fast, like usually within a few days only. Um, and there is a continuous discussion about that. Um, the main method is still microsatellites. We still use the microsatellites to be able to compare it to our old data. We don't do any high throughput sequencing with it because it would take too long. It would take us several weeks to provide results. And that's not possible uh, uh, in Germany. People expect results faster. Um, of course, the identification with the haplotypes, we heard that today already, still exists, is still useful. And uh, not exactly monthly, but in, in, in uh, several times a year, we run reduced SNP chips, especially for hybrid assessment, because this is a continuing discussion. And there are some other marker systems up to whole genome sequencing that is done uh, uh, in the frame of research that we do with those samples. Um, this is samples in the, the, the last uh, monitoring year. 3,500 samples. I think this year it's about 4,000 samples that we get um, every year, which results then in about two to 2,500 wolf detections and several hundreds of, hundreds of individuals. Sometimes there is hybrids. Usually in one season, it's no hybrid or probably one single hybrid. Hybridization is very rare in Germany. The population is very pure, doesn't contain a lot of stock in the genome, obviously. And from time to time, we have golden jackal detections. 
The data is put in such a, a database with all the individuals. So far, it's 2,400 individuals that have been detected so far genetically. So that's the genetic microsatellite profiles. This is a pack with changing parents over time, and you can track the entire history of this wolf population. Here you see the pedigree until 2015. Uh, that contains a lot of information about migration of animals, mating, um, full sip mating. So inbreeding, you see it here in the double lines. And we have this ongoing pedigree that gets, however, more and more difficult to maintain because so far uh, we will probably soon reach about like 200 packs. And then it really becomes difficult to keep that pedigree. But we need it to identify the packs because the monitoring in Germany is not based on counting animals, individuals. You will never be able to assess them all but to count packs. So in blue, those are the wolf packs. And there is a homepage, and everybody can see what's going on. There are a lot of details if you're interested in the German wolf recolonization. Very briefly, of course, if you have such a detailed database of wolf genotypes, if you have a new wolf, even if it pops up in some surrounding countries like Denmark, you can see if you have it in your database, or if you know the parents or, or um, other relatives, so that helps you a lot to understand long distance dispersal events. Uh, like here are some examples, wolves that migrated from Eastern Germany to Denmark. This only works if you can compare your data and exchange samples with the surrounding countries and Central Europe is not very isolated. Um, so what we did early on to track this newly forming population of Central European wolves that formed from this Baltic, Eastern Polish wolf population, and it worked out very well in all most surrounding countries around Germany, Poland, uh, Czech Republic, um, the Netherlands, Belgium, Denmark, and some others, Austria is on the way. Uh, they adopted our marker system. We have a common marker system. We are doing ring testing and we are regularly exchanging data in the moment. It's like every day um, there is some communication between the countries. Can you check the profile? Do you know that wolf? Where is it in the moment? What did it do? And so on. So this is really an amazing story. Uh, it, it involves a lot of time, um, but this is something really rewarding to do um, to harmonize the method. And um, I come to an end slowly. This is another example. It has been showed. We are still using like classical empty DNA in microsatellites um, to analyze kill samples, about 2,000 swap samples, even more now per year. One region from a hot spot, from a livestock hot spot in northern Germany, in lower Saxony. Uh, and you see several individuals who are involved in this uh, uh, um, in these livestock kills. So this is important. Most samples in Germany are actually assumed livestock kills more than scats or, or other sample types now. Oh yeah, last thing, I forgot hybridization. And I think in every country, a big, big, big uh, uh, matter of dispute. And what we did, we developed with other colleagues in Finland, Italy, and other country, um, a marker set of 96 SNPs, which are optimized to for hybrid assessment. So it differentiates wolves and other canids from domestic dogs and it works from portugal to uh, uh, eastern siberia it doesn't matter where the wolf comes from major advantage to classic microsatellites and you can analyze hybridization up to the fourth generation so the third backcross generation to parental wolves which is about six percent wolf content um, you see here dogs you see known hybrids from germany and finland and you see wolves from different uh, about 800, 700 from Russia, from Poland, from Germany, it's blue. Uh, many people claimed and media claimed all oh, the wolves in Germany must be hybrids and in Russia they are much more pure and in fact it's simply not true. Here you see the wolf, um, um, the European wolf, which all have like similar degrees of, 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 uh, of introgression, which are very, very low actually. Um, so we could disprove that the hybridization rate is less than 1% for Germany. So I come to an end. This wildcat is really pissed. I hope you guys are happy. Thanks for listening. Bye. Thank you, Kirsten, for, for your presentation. Uh, we have now five minutes. Uh, if you, any of you have any questions? for the
Okay. I have a first question by, uh, for Ruben about the, what is the idea? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, uh, the question is, what is the goal of identifying the problematic birds? Is there an intention to do active management or there was just an, an anecdote in the well, case? So we, at least there we focused, because we own four hunting concession in, in the exact area. That's not the total area that you showed on the map, it's just half of it. So in that hunting concession, we have the rights to do management, management as well. Uh, we focus on two aspects. First is prevention. We built two rapid intervention team in, in the area that are over there. They, they are local rangers. They live in the project area and they are there 24 hours uh, per day uh, responding to the, to the bears attacks. Uh, the, the first, uh, the rationale behind identifying, yeah, counting the, dam the problem bears was first to direct the efforts of this rapid intervention team in, into the field. And we hope to do that based with the, yeah, to install uh, the colors now. We, we, we bought five of that types of uh, virtual fence alert colors. And yeah, for example, deciding how many colors to put is based on that data set that, that, that we get. We also do uh, uh, hunting management, uh, but not trophy hunting. We extracted in total three individuals in, uh, in our project area. And what, Shooting the right bear is it's a big challenge. It's very difficult to 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 tell when you have your your, your gun, you know, to tell uh, exactly that's the problematic bear. But at least you know the magnitude of the problem in in that uh, hotspots of conflict, and you with the, this type of data you can tell how many to extract to you know to, to relax a bit the the the. The conflict because the things are getting crazy there. You get protests in the streets, so there are years where the number of conflicts are are actually very high. It depends a lot on uh, food resources, uh, productivity, productivity like like beech nuts and whatever. Yeah, I hope this answered your question. Okay. okay. Um, to Kasten and maybe Paolo as well concerning hybridization. Just wanted to ask if um, there's any data on detecting hybridization in the past, like using the historical samples, and and what approach would you use, and what results would you expect if that's possible to have data in such amount as the present data? I can. I can start answering. I, I probably did not get the question fully. It's about a, a more ancient uh, hybridization, right? That was the question, how to assess that. Yep. Okay, we have we are using, uh, there are two approaches I can think of. The one approach is if you have like genome-wide data, you can try to go back in time um, and uh, to compare the ancient hybridization, older hybridization events to younger ones an approach that we did for the wildcat, we just, uh, the manuscript has just been accepted is we took museum samples. So we looked to the major bottleneck in German wildcats was about hundred years ago. We wanted to know, has this recolonization of wildcat in Germany led to increased hybridization rate? The answer is no. Um, the old uh, samples, which is 100, 150 years ago, show similar hybridization rate, not a big difference. Um, to what we find now. So genomics and uh, uh, taking museum samples or ancient samples, I think is the solution for that. Okay, thank you. Um, we, we got another question from Mexico and for you, Karsten also. Uh, how many microsatellites uh, did you use in the WOLF study? We have quite a low number compared to other labs. We use uh, 13 plus two sex determining markers. Uh, and if some problems arise, that's sometimes not enough, actually, uh, we can complement it with SNPs. But I know other labs use like around 20, for instance, which uh, uh, is recommendable. OK, thank you very much. Um, any more questions? 
Okay. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, everybody. And Kasten, we know you are leaving now, so thank you very much for your for your presence here. Bye bye. We move. Uh, we move in, We are moving on to the next section about uh, genetic uh, threats. Uh, just a minute. Okay, next uh, section uh, will be centered on genetic threats. Uh, we've got with us uh, Romolo Caniglia uh, from the uh, from ISPRA, the Institute of en Environmental Protection and Research, Jose Antonio Godoy, and Carlos Villa uh, from the Estación Biológica de Doñana. Uh, we are starting with uh, Romolo. Romolo, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Can you see me? Yeah, perfect. Yes. Okay, I can uh, share my uh, my desktop. Okay, can we hear my desktop? Yeah, yeah, everything okay. Uh, okay, I will start. First of all, uh, thank you, thank you very much for uh, the organization of this very interesting uh, international uh, workshop and uh, uh, for uh, inviting our team to participate. In uh, our presentation, we will focus uh, on uh, some uh, um, uh, major anthropogenic uh, threats affecting the conservation of the Italian wolf uh, population. As most of you know, uh, the Italian wolf population uh, represents uh, a, a genetic uh, uniqueness, uh, uh, since uh, this uh, wolf population is the uh, most differentiated uh, wolf population in the world. But uh, at the same time, the Italian wolf population represents also an unquestionable conservational success uh, because it started to um, uh, increase uh, after the uh, risk of uh, uh, extinction occurred during the, um, uh, the 70s. Uh, however, uh, despite this ongoing numerical and uh, geographical uh, um, increasing, uh, the Italian wolf population is uh, still seriously uh, threatened by uh, high uh, mortality uh, rates, mainly due to illegal uh, poachings, uh, due to um, conflicts with the human activities and uh, uh, to uh, an, uh, an atavical fear towards the predator. But uh, um, uh, this population is also uh, threatened uh, by uh, the um, anthropogenic hybridization with the domestic uh, uh, dog. A, a recent study um, uh, analyzing uh, uh, more than 200 uh, wolf carcasses collected uh, during the last uh, 15 years in the northern uh, Apennines showed that uh, most of the collected carcasses had died uh, due to uh, human twanthropic uh, causes, especially to illegal uh, killings. Uh, such high um, mortality uh, rates uh, can impact not uh, only uh, on uh, uh, the abundance of the uh, Italian world population, but they can um, also uh, facilitate uh, wolf dog at uh, because of the destruction of uh, wild pack uh, cohesion. The presence of hybrid in Italy started to be documented um, during uh, the 70s, when the first scientific studies uh, were carried uh, out, and when some uh, animals with anomalous uh, morphological traits uh, started to be uh, observed. 
For this reason, uh, we uh, started the, the uh, first uh, genetic investigations uh, uh, on uh, the topic of wolf dog hybridization with the first scientific uh, genetic paper published uh, in the uh, 2000. Uh, and this paper uh, clearly showed that the few uh, found dead animals analyzed at the mitochondrial DNA uh, had no um, uh, private dog uh, um, haplotypes. However, these results were only preliminary uh, because they were based uh, on uh, the analysis of uh, only a matrilineal uh, marker. For these reasons, during the first, uh, uh, during the following years, um, uh, hybridization uh, started to be uh, analyzed uh, using uh, uh, nuclear uh, markers such as linked and unlinked macrosatellites and uh, uh, possible uh, uh, signals of uh, um, dog ancestry uh, were investigated uh, using uh, Bayesian uh, assignment uh, procedures. These uh, first uh, nuclear studies clearly demonstrated that the gene pools of wolves and the dog continued to clearly uh, remain uh, separated. However, some individuals analyzed showed not neglectable uh, dog uh, ancestry. However, once again, uh, these uh, studies were uh, only uh, preliminary, uh, showing only uh, partial uh, uh, results, uh, because uh, they were based on the analysis of a few uh, carcasses randomly uh, collected and uh, a um, deeper uh, overview of the um, uh, uh, phenomenon uh, started to be possible only uh, with the activation of large scale and uh, long term um, monitoring projects uh, based on the uh, analysis of uh, uh, not only uh, found the dead or um, live trapped animals, but especially on non-invasively collected samples from the entire Italian territory. And a more comprehensive overview of the phenomenon, I mean, uh, the proportion of hybridization and its uh, directionality were possible because all these uh, different kinds of uh, biological samples started to be uh, analyzed simultaneously at the nuclear uh, markers, nuclear macrosatellites, macrosatellites on the uh, Y chromosome, um, mitochondrial uh, regions, and even on the coding uh, uh, genes, uh, such as the beta defensin, which can uh, provide uh, information about the code color anomalies, uh, even um, uh, for samples non-invasively uh, collected. However, to uh, avoid the risk to arbitrarily um, classify um, uh, as a hybrid or pure and a non-genotype uh, during uh, assignment procedures, we recently developed a standardized approach to define reliable assignment uh, thresholds. Our operational workflow uh, uses uh, uh, wolf and dog reliable reference populations uh, uh, verified genomically and morphologically, um, simulate the pure and uh, admixed genotypes, robust Bayesian assignment uh, uh, methods able to assign unknown genotypes one by one to the reference populations, and uh, um, reliable cut thresholds defined thanks to performance uh, analysis able to minimize uh, both type 1 and type 2 uh, errors. This approach uh, allowed us uh, to um, uh, classify unknown genotypes in three different uh, assignment uh, classes. I mean, pure individuals with uh, uh, no uh, clear uh, dog uh, ancestry, 
older admixed individuals showing uh, only marginal dog ancestry and the recent admixed individuals showing uh, clear dog ancestry and um, based on um, their potential uh, to spread uh, dog uh, variants, these uh, assignment uh, categories uh, were used uh, to define three corresponding uh, management uh, categories corresponding to operational pure individuals uh, uh, for which no uh, management uh, actions are required, introgressed individuals for which only uh, low priority uh, actions can be required, and uh, operational hybrids for which high priority management actions are uh, necessary. During the last years, we uh, started to investigate the topic of wolf dog admixture, even using uh, uh, genome wide uh, approaches. For example, we applied a panel of uh, 170,000 uh, SNPs. Uh, to uh, identify uh, hybrids ancient uh, until the uh, 19th generation uh, from uh, sampling uh, um, to estimate the timing uh, uh, since the admixture and also to identify the genetic basis of some anomalous morphological traits such as uh, black coats, white nails, and the spur on the hind legs, uh, which are considered putative indicators of hybridization. Uh, finally, we uh, also analyzed the whole um, uh, genomes uh, from individuals uh, belonging uh, to uh, the uh, Southern European wolf uh, populations to assess past demographic histories, divergence times, and also ancient uh, gene uh, flow. Um, importantly, uh, from this uh, genomic uh, data, we were also uh, able to select uh, reduced uh, uh, panels of uh, uh, SNPs in collaboration with uh, our uh, European uh, colleagues. Uh, which were uh, able to be used uh, not only um, with uh, invasive DNA samples, but also with non-invasive um, DNA uh, samples. For example, we were able to select and develop a panel of SNPs uh, able uh, to uh, well distinguish wolves, uh, uh, dogs, uh, the first generation hybrids and the first generation of the crosses at the whole European level. But we were also able to select another reduced panel of uh, SNPs able to well distinguish anthropogenic hybridization from natural gene flow, especially among wolf populations living in the uh, historical glacial uh, refugia. In conclusion, to overcome the non limit in combining data obtained from different conservation laboratories, from different population studies, from different monitoring projects, it could be useful to create a network of experts and all the uh, conservation laboratories, the universities and the institutions involved uh, could uh, use um, a common approach uh, to uh, collect uh, um, data, uh, a common approach uh, to uh, morphologically uh, analyze uh, carcasses uh, and also common approaches to uh, make a toxicological analysis to compare uh, dead uh, causes, but also similar genotyping uh, protocols. Um, hybrid uh, detection could be based um, in uh, genotyping uh, approaches uh, using uh, the uh, same criteria to select uh, correct reference uh, domestic and wild uh, populations. 
the same computational analysis uh, uh, for assignment procedures, but uh, also the same uh, criteria uh, to uh, select, to define reliable assignment uh, uh, thresholds according to the uh, particular investigated uh, situation. All the results uh, derived from uh, monitoring uh, uh, projects, uh, uh, both uh, um, uh, about uh, uh, morphological and toxicological analysis and genetic investigations, could flow in a common shared international uh, database dedicated to the monitoring of the wolf and of its uh, conservation and the management uh, problems. And uh, thanks for your uh, attention. I don't know if there are some questions. Thank you, Romolo. Yeah, there is already a question, but uh, we will share all of them at the end of the vlog, if you don't mind. Uh, we invite Jose Antonio Godoy. Yeah. OK. Es esta, ¿verdad? Godoy Toledo. La voy a copiar un segundo. Bueno, me dice que hay uno. Bueno, por si acaso. Por si acaso. Ahí está. Voy a abrirlo. Voy a expulsar tu USB para que no se nos quede ahí. He abrido la... Ay, he abrido. He abierto. Okay. Perdón. No. <risa> ya. Mira tu velocidad. Voy a compartir pantalla okay. para que ya aparezca. Y te la voy a... Es esta, ¿verdad? Voy a presentar. Thank you. Let's start. Uh, so my intention here with this talk is showing you a clear example of genetic erosion occurring in a small population, an isolated population, and how genetic and genomics can help to diagnose and to oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uh, and how genetics and genomics can help to diagnose in the first place if there is a problem and then to guide management actions that can alleviate those problems. So the paradigm of genetic erosion and genetic conservation genetics in general is that, okay, uh, genetics will not drive a species to extinction. And then the other causes are uh, causing the, the species to become small and isolated, and that those are the main problems that need to be solved. But once population are small, then genetic issues start to, 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 to be important, to become important. And that's because small populations will uh, have problems, problems with survival, with reproduction, have lower fitness overall, so that populations will remain small. And that will happen even if, uh, the original causes disappear. I mean, this is a, a feedback loop that it start, once started, it will continue to happen and precipitate the extinction. So the example is the Iberian lynx. So for, for those from Iberia that are familiarized with that, let me just say that it, we just knew that early enough that, that it went through a steep decline and, and intense fragmentation in, during the second half of the century that's represented in the in the map there, until by the end of the century, we had only two populations left, and very small, both of them. So less than 100 individuals total was, were estimated by 2002. By applying molecular markers in this case, mostly, um, we were able to reconstruct the history of this 
uh, scenario. So, and we could, uh, by applying molecular markers to historical and also ancient uh, um, samples, we were able to reconstruct this history, as I said. So, and we draw a picture of an ancestral links population that was kind of pamictic, so, so it was not a structure. Uh, and it had moderate levels of diversity, never high, uh, in fact, but uh, during the few centuries, last few centuries, this fragmentation started. So we could, were able to reconstruct the process, the patterns, and until uh, the species were left with two populations here in Doñana and uh, the one in Sierra Morena in Andujar. Uh, it's important, and the, the picture shows that, is that the history of the populations are very different. Doñana has been isolated and remains small uh, for, we estimated like two, 200 years, so for the last two centuries. While Sierra Morena, Andujar, is the remnant of a large and connected populations and only became isolated and small maybe a few decades ago. So, and that's reflected in the genetic patterns. So you will see Doñana is highly eroded um, and um, not so much Anduja. The numbers down there that you cannot see because of this, oh, you can. Ah. Okay, but now I, I, I have to go back. <laughs> Okay, great. But now I cannot move slides. No, no, I can't. Not, not in these patterns. Yes. yes. Okay, nice. Thank you. <laughs> so this is just to show that the, the numbers down there, it kind of reflects the inbreeding accumulated by the two populations relative to these ancestral pangmictic populations. So as you see, it's 61% for Doñana, it's only 17, only 17 for four and okay? Um, so by, by 2002, that, that was a situation, that was what Rayman. Uh, we had numbers showing, trying to estimate the diversity of these populations using markers. There are not that useful, and I will, you will probably understand why later, but uh, the, the, the species, the, the Berlinx became one of the first endangered species to have the genome sequence that happened a few years ago, thanks to uh, the effort of many people uh, and the funding of a few uh, important funds from uh, Banco, so in, in fact, as well. Um, so, so I'm also showing what we learned from, from whole genomes that we didn't learn from from microsatellite markers. Um, and the first thing that we got was a comparable and biased estimate of genetic diversity. And this estimate showed the links was, the variant links was at the time, the species with the lowest genetic diversity genome-wide. So, um, and it has remained, <laughs> I bet it still is, the, the, the species with the lowest diversity, uh, or even when other low diversity species have been sequenced and, and are in there, in the low part of the graphs. The other nice thing you already heard about is another way that genome, the genomics provide of estimating inbreeding, and in fact, visualizing inbreeding. And that's where, this is the diversity you see in, along the chromosome represented. So the flat line here is no diversity. And you see a link from Doniana has these long stretches of lack of diversity, of homozygosity. That, those are the term you hear, you heard before of rung of homozygosities. The longer, the more recent inbreeding that is showing. So long stretches are clear indicative that this animal received a long stretch that is identical from the father and from the mother. So. Uh, that can only happen through inbreeding. So, and smaller, I mean, the distribution of sizes of these uh, stretches of homozygosity is also reflective of the history, of the, the demographic history of the population. So, 
And you see here, Linksys Indoniana have both a large extent of long runs and a large extent of middle-sized runs, indicating that the two processes are occurring in recent inbreeding and small population sizes for the last few centuries. Um, more recently, we, we tried so, so far, yes, confirm what we suspected that the, the large extent of genomic erosion in the Iberian links. So we wanted to, to go further into it, uh, taking advantage of these uh, genomes and the possibility of sequencing more and more uh, individuals, uh, whole genomes. Um, and one of the uh, things that we wondered were, okay, uh, uh, following a bottleneck, the diversity is lost, and that's the more uh, known and more common uh, process uh, referred to, to genomic erosion. But there are other processes too that contribute to the genomic erosion, and that's reflected here. So basically what we did is measure, compare diversity of a bottleneck and a non-bottleneck population that's closely related, and see how the diversity compared. So we had a measure of relative diversity loss along the genomes. And here we, we classified different regions of the genome in terms, for instance, uh, according to the, uh, the function or the lack of function for intergenic is mostly neutral. So, and CDS is the genes, the coding regions of the genes. So those are selected. So you have this range of features on the genome that has different degree of selection occurring because they are more uh, tolerant to variation or not, right? So, and what we see here is that loss is widespread, diversity is widespread, but there are particular features in the genome that are not losing that much of the diversity. In fact, the most conserved features, that's the ultra conserved elements, those are very singular um, pieces of the genome where that do not vary at all, even across mammals, for example, have exact same sequences across mammals. That means that they are intolerant, highly intolerant to any variation. Any variation is eliminated by selection probably. And what we see there is that bottleneck populations do have some diversity in those regions where healthy populations have no diversity at all. So that's reflecting one of the uh, dangerous processes occurring in small population is that uh, variants that are, are, are maintained at low diversity by selection efficiently in large populations will accumulate slowly in uh, small populations. But that's the kind of diversity we don't want. That's, that's the bad diversity. That's the, probably the deleterious variation that is accumulating, okay? The other uh, opportunity we took of having access to this variation along the genome is to go step, uh, one step further and try to characterize um, coding variants according to the predicted effect on the protein. So basically each variant that is segregating in the abelian links is somehow classified in tolerant or tolerated and um, highly deleterious, basically. That's based on bioinformatics, basically. So, so we don't have a clue uh, to, to what's happening with those variants, what, what, what's doing those variants in, in, in the physiology or in the functioning. But several clues are uh, suggesting that some of those variants must be uh, deleterious, must be affecting protein function, for example, or, or even uh, eliminating the function of the protein. So those are the ones here. And we wonder, okay, can we see higher amount of those uh, variants, deleterious variants in Iberian links compared to Eurasian links that is widespread and is healthy? And the, the, the answer is, okay, uh, it's, this is just quantifying how many variants are in, in each individual genome, in each of those categories. And you see that Eurasian and Iberian has similar number of derived uh, alleles, neutral alleles, and even same number of um, uh, tolerated alleles, so low effect variants in coding regions, but the Iberian links has lower amount of highly deleterious variants. And that's reflecting the other process that in this case is positive, is that in small populations, highly deleterious variants are reduced 
with respect to, to large populations. So because uh, that it affects mostly to recessive, highly deleterious uh, variants. Those are accumulates in larger population because it's, they are not expressed. They occur in heterozygotes. They are not expressed, they cause no problem. So there are many in the large populations. Small population, those are brought into homophagosis by breeding or by a small population size. They are expressed and they are selected against, so the number is reduced. That, those are good news for the ovarian lynx. So the ovarian lynx is purged. We will call that purging, it's, it's purged to some extent. But that doesn't mean that the ovarian lynx has higher fitness than the Eurasian. Uh, because the fewer, I mean, they have fewer of those variants, but some of those occurs in high frequencies. They are fixed, in fact. So if you we represent the amount that is in homocytosity in, in each species, you see that the ovarian lynx has a uh, higher amount of variants in heterozygosity. So the, predict the prediction and the theoretical uh, expectation as well is that small populations will always have lower fitness than larger population despite the occurrence of purging. Okay, and can we see any problems in the links that we can relate somehow to this genetic erosion? Well, there are many observations, circumstantial observations that could be related, could be, could have genetic causes, um, a high, a large frequency of higher uh, potentially genetic disorders or diseases or whatever, some of those are there. For some of those, there is good evidence that they are have a genetic basis, for others not. Um, the susceptibility to, to diseases was also a main concern in aberrant links. Uh, sorry. And a litter size has, is really small, was really small in the low, uh, in Doniana, for example. That, that was reduced from typically three to typically two at some point, coinciding with uh, low and lower diversity and higher in breeding. So those are circumstantial evidence. The, the, properly, the, the most direct evidence of inbreeding depression, so breeding causing problems, is this uh, graph that I showed there, where more consanguineous uh, inbred animals have higher proportion of abnormal sperm, so maybe lower fertility, okay? So basically, the links illustrate the occurrence of this extinction vortex. So small population having uh, deteriorated genetics and that causing fitness problems that maintains the populations in, in at small sizes and eventually susceptible to extinction. Um, Okay, that's not the case anymore. All, all of that I said refers to the 2002 situation. So that's the low end, the low valley of the of the species. After that, uh, as you know, a uh, lot of effort was put on on uh, very lynx conservation, and that include, and this is a graphical representation of what's going on at this stage. So we have the two remnant populations there. Um, and from there, a few, probably more than 10 years ago, um, the captive population was uh, uh, set with four breeding centers and uh, animals from both uh, remnant populations were incorporated into captivity as founders, okay? And at the same time, uh, animals were moved from one population to the other, from Andujar, the, the higher diversity one, to the smaller uh, Doñana population. And in the latest year, a few reintroduction sites were established and received animals born in captivity, were liberated into new areas of historical presence. And I must say that everything that, that uh, could go wrong with Iberian links, with all these uncertain management strategies, went well. I mean, captivity was a success, reintroduction is being a success, so those are good news. So what, what I'm focusing here is that for those actions, we need, you need genetic management, especially in a species that is highly deteriorated like this. So the, the, all the goal of manage, genetic management is preserving 
whatever diversity is left and trying to produce as soon as possible animals that are not inbred at all. And the easiest way of doing that is by mixing the two populations. So that occurred in captivity and also occurred in Doñana by the translocation of individuals. Okay. And that this is shown here that by mixing the top populations and applying a genetic ma management strategy that's simply based on um, giving priority to animals that have that shows low kinship with the rest of the population, so somehow they are more unique or less represented in the populations, uh, and avoiding the, the mating of close relatives, we were able to, to create animals that are, in fact, um, less inbred than uh, wild animals in, in the red population. populations. So, so they are more genetically healthy than wild animals. And, and we approach, in fact, we, we approach, this is empirically monitored with markers and we, we are kind of approaching the highest possible diversity with the diversity that was left. So, and there are reasons to believe that, I mean, this is just confirming that the, there was a in breeding depression problem in the species, just by showing that when you uh, suppress inbreeding by mixing the two populations, the hybrids had higher fitness. So here in captivity, we were able to show uh, higher uh, reproductive success of hybrids and lower mortality of, uh, uh, I mean, higher mortality in more inbred individuals, so, so uh, showing inbreeding depression. In the wild, if only one animal was translocated and the first animal that was moved was highly successful and several animals were released afterwards. But the thing is that most of the uh, reproduction uh, taking place in following these translocations were due to, to release animals or descendants of habits of descent of release animals. And that has certainly resulted in two main uh, results. It, once, uh, genetic diversity has increased following the translocation, and also uh, mm, the population has started to grow. Uh, this is well, maybe coincidental, right? But but um, there are reasons to believe that mm, genetics is playing a role here, and this, we are talking here of a genetic rescue because just by improving genetics, you improve demography, right? Um, I will not get more into that, but uh, that's something that we that we think, and, and it's shown by 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 this analysis. So here is some evidence that again in the wild, the hybrids have higher reproductive performance than the the pure bred. Okay, so in regarding finishing with regarding the reintroductions, I mean. Those have started, and it's easy to, to simulate or predict that small populations that are being funded in the new reintroduction sites will, uh, will lose diversity uh, quickly if, if they are not managed or, or if they do not receive immigrants, uh, right? Um, so we, it's imperative to, to do some genetic management also to reintroduction. So our goal with this new with, uh, life project is uh, to, to extend the genetic management from captivity into the wild, into the reintroduced populations. And for that, we need, to remember, the strategy is minimizing kinship. So we need to estimate kinship. And we can do that by uh, extending the genealogy that's fully known in captivity. But once captive animals are released, we need to know who's breeding, who's not breeding, and, and to follow the descendant of those early crosses. By doing that, we can then adjust at the release of the subsequent releases, and we will release animals that are less related to those that are in the populations. Once, you know, have left or died or so, that's a that's small opportunity, window of opportunity, because you can only do that during the releases. Uh, and it, that's the most critical part, because if you fail to do that during the early releases, diversity will be lost, and then you have to rely on 
list is fine management. Okay. And that requires knowing what's happening in the reintroduction sites. And there we are proposing uh, non-invasive genetics to, to, to learn that. Who's there, who's uh, reproducing, who's the father. And we can do that with uh, a SNP set, a marker set optimized to do that. Uh, that's also a consequence, a, a side effect of the genomics. I mean, we could select highly efficient SNP markers, even for this low diversity species. And this is just to show a pilot study in Valle do Guadiana. We did in collaboration with Portuguese uh, colleagues, uh, ICNF there. And um, well, there are some ideas there, but the nice story that we were able to reconstruct is that we documented the, the arrival of a migrant from Doniana, natural migrant from Doniana into Valle do Guadiana in Portugal. And we uh, demonstrated that this individual killed a family of foxes upon arrival uh, and mate, mated with the female, resident female, the first year. So, and, and he did also that in the second, subsequent year. So, so that this is just an anecdotal, anecdotal uh, story, but once that illustrate the power to monitor, closely monitor individually, uh, uh, links in this incipient population. So the idea is to apply that extensively in this live project to all reintroduction sites. And remember, this is kind of different from what you heard earlier of applying non-invasive genetics to estimate population size. Because we're not estimating population size with capture recapture. Uh, no, we are, we are trying to census, I mean, to, to, to identify each individual, place it in the genealogy, right? Uh, because that's what we need for the genetic management. And it's an ambitious project. It will require the effort of many people in the field collecting feces and large uh, effort also in the lab and coordination of databases that that's challenges that we need to address. But I think it's a, a, a nice project a nice initiative that will somehow you know, uh, serve as a, a touch, touchstone for, for future projects for introduction projects. I, I think that's all. That's the good news is that all this uh, resulted in increases in population size that we are now over 100 in the latest census. census. And well, one, one last word that, that's the present. Uh, what about the future? I mean, and, and you heard uh, Linda uh, talking about this, how to estimate favorable conservation status, including genetics. Um, and that's certainly a requirement. We try to apply the same strategy that Linda used with wolves in Scandinavia and Fenoscandia uh, to the situation of the Iberian links, taking into account a, a realistic scenario. I mean, we, we, there you, you can see the remnants, the, the reintroduction sites, and we kind of model that to conclude, to try to figure out what would, should be the objective. What would be the scenario that reached the, those any 500 in the future as a meta population uh, size? And um, well, it's clear that we need more than the, that's in, that we have now. I mean, we need more reintroduction sites, more populations, and it will be critical to maintain those population connected uh, at a rate we estimated one to, to four uh, migrants per, per generation. So, and the target that for demographic uh, goals was on around seven or 800, we uh, you estimated in, in the last workshop, I think. So if we want to meet also the genetic viability criteria that should be increased to, to more than 1000 breeding females. So, uh, well, we'll see that, that that's the target. <laughs> and that's all, I mean, you I will not go so that, yes, this is broader implications that for other people that are working in other species, that genetics and even more genomics now can serve to diagnose the problems that may be occurring in your populations, that the population you're interested in, and that are kind of cryptic. You, you will not know why the population is going down, but you have ways of investigating that, of diagnosing a possible genetic erosion effect. 
And there are, the good news, there are solutions to that, usually in the forms of genetic rescue, moving animals around, and, and you can do that uh, for, for the smallest amount of money. Uh, so, so it's worth investment <laughs> in any case. Okay, acknowledgement, and I guess we, I'm over to my time, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Jose Antonio. And we end with a message uh, of hope. And now comes Carlos Villa, I'm afraid, with a very different story. Para ejecutar esto también. Y ahí. Ok. Ok. Thank you for waiting till so late. And before starting, I would just, I would like to remark something. What we just heard. It's a science fiction story. <laughs> no, no, what I mean is that science fiction might become reality. I don't think that there are many other species of maybe more than two or three around the world that they have at this level of active management, active genetic management and conservation. That is an amazing story, an amazing example. And it's great to have people like this telling these kind of stories because this is completely unique. It's wonderful to hear these kind of stories and that is going well. This is not so good. <laughs> okay, I'm going to tell you about the, about walls. We're going back to walls. And this is the story of the Sierra Morena wolf population. It's a more simple story. We are not going to see many words, but I'm try I was just simply trying to show what we can do with genomic data also, but even if we have only one sample or just a handful of samples, very few individuals, that can tell us a lot of information about what is going on in a natural population. Okay, let's, let's talk about wolves. This is uh, more or less is not updated, but is the distribution of the wolves in Europe. We see that they are quite widespread, large populations, very promising. If we have seen these kind of maps before, the populations are expanding. This was the situation in the. You can see the portion. Yeah. So this is the situation uh, in the middle of the 20th century, and since then. The populations have expanded a lot. We can see that basically Scandinavia was empty, was recolonized. The Italian wolves were just a few populations. They expanded. They went into the into the Alps, into France. They even reached the Pyrenees. Basically, all the populations have expanded. The Spanish population, the northwestern population in Spain, well, has expanded also a little bit, okay, but not so much. How did this expansion take place, okay? We have seen also figures from this paper before. It's because of the long dispersal movements. You see all these red arrows representing movements of walls from one place to another. And do you see a pattern here? I don't see a single arrow within Spain. We don't have any evidence of long distance dispersals. Sometimes in in the Iberian Peninsula, we are very excited saying, oh yeah, we have this person of the walls of reaching Madrid. They are expanding the distribution range 15 kilometers. Okay, um, Joaquin was telling us that, well, this person movements over a thousand kilometers in, uh, in Germany, and um, we have very long distance dispersal across Europe, but this is not going on in the Iberian Peninsula. Mm, we don't know why. No? But is, you see that there are some individuals arriving to the Iberian Peninsula from Italy. 
but that isn't the long distance long distance dispersal. But let's go back to the figure that we saw earlier. Walls have been expanding all over, populations are increasing. You see the, the 10 populations that were described by Chapron and company, all of them have expanded. But look at number nine. Number nine is the Sierra Morena wolf population. That was, well, extending from Portugal to all along Sierra Morena. In 2011, they were considering that, well, while other wolf populations all over Europe were expanding, this one was decreasing. Okay, the first reaction is, well, probably for those that do not know the area, okay, a horrible habitat, high humanized areas. Well, not quite. It is probably the best area in Spain, you could think, no? There is a lot of uh, forest, a uh, huge number of red deer, wild boar, very small population size, human population size. So in principle, it seems ideal. Yeah, things is even <laughs> surviving. Yeah, but the number of wolves was very small. In fact, this is the map of the, of the atlas and it was still quite generous. And well, we knew that things were not going as well as in other areas of Europe. And for quite a few years, the Junta de Andalucía, the Andalusian government had been trying to monitor these populations, had, uh, had some people tracking the number of breeders. And these are the official data from the Junta de Andalucía. At, from 1998 to 2010, they were estimating there were six to seven packs breeding there. But look what happens starting in 2004. There was three packs. The following year, three packs, two, 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 one, 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 one. And there is no evidence of reproduction since then. The last pack of wolves to reproduce in Sierra Morena was in 2013. Uh, there are some observations, some possible observations of wolves in 2014, mm, but yeah, the population was collapsing in an area that was ideal. Um, we did not know what was going on, but um, a master student proposed a project that involved sequencing some uh, some wolf samples, and we managed to get one sample from Sierra Morena, one animal roadkill close to Andujar in 2003. That was all the recent samples that we had from Sierra Morena. And what our goal was to sequence that individual. That was fine. And the project was financed by the Barcelona Zoo, so we're also trying to sequence the whole genome. Of, of an animal from the zoo to see if they were representing the natural population. And we already had some sequences of Spanish and Portuguese wolves that had appeared in previous publications. So basically, we only had four genome sequences, one from Sierra Morena. And well, this is a study when the study where it was, and this study was published. But look at this. This is the samples that were including in that study that could be, now we could add many more, but basically the pattern is the same. This column, this is heterozygosity. This is a measure of overall genome diversity. And higher values, higher diversity. And you can see that the one from Sierra Morena, sorry, the first four are the ones from the Iberian Peninsula. But this one from Sierra Morena had a value lower than the other ones from Spain, lower from Croatia, from China, from India. The only ones that were lower than the Sierra Morena were the ones from the Great Lakes, uh, sorry, from the uh, uh, Italy, oops, sorry. The one from Italy and the ones from Mexico. Mexico, the Mexican wolf population derived from a captive breeding program. There were animals that were taken from captivity and released into the wild. So we knew that we're expecting very low genetic diversity. The Italian wolf, well, we know that has gone through a dramatic bottleneck. So those are the only ones that have lower genetic diversity than the Sierra Morena wolf. But it still, it's not that bad. It's not as bad as with the lynx. 
Okay, but this is the overall, the overall genetic, genetic diversity across the entire genome. But since we have the genome, we can try to map this genetic diversity along all the chromosomes. We can see how the, the genetic variability is distributed. Jose Antonio has shown a little bit what happened with the lynxes, and we could see areas with low variability, high, areas with high variability. So this is what we did. We have here the four walls from Sierra Morena, from Northern Spain, from Portugal, and the one from the zoo. We can see this line, this blue line going up and down. The numbers up here represent the chromosomes. Well, it's difficult to see anything here, no? Let's focus a little bit. This is just an example. Uh, we can see for three chromosomes, this is one, another one, another one, some variation on the chromosome and some red blocks that is where the diversity reaches zero. Is what Jose Antonio was telling us, like runs of homozygosity, proportions of the chromosomes that have no variability, okay? By random, we can have these regions in the genome can be expected, no? So let's go back to the figure with the, with the curves and just focus on two of the individuals. The top one, the Sierra Morena wolf. The other one is another one from Northern Spain. If you look at the, the one on top, the one from Sierra Morena, there are lots of red. There are lots of regions of the genome that have no variability. And this is just a fragment of that genome. You can see that in chromosome 17, chromosome 18, practically the entire chromosome had zero variability, had extremely low diversity. Okay, So this is telling us that this population was declining, that had one, one breeding pack for many years, the diversity was getting lost and lost and lost and reached zero across many of the chromosomes. Okay. So this is telling us something about the problems of small populations. Jose Antonio has been telling us about the lynxes. This is what has been going on with this wolf population. It was so small that individuals were forced to mate brother with sister, father with daughter for multiple generations. Inbreeding. And we all know what happens with inbreeding. We saw the, some, the royalty in Europe this morning, and we know the kind of problems that this is associated with. We know, and Jose Antonio was telling us about the problems that inbreeding has brought to the lynx population. Okay, so there is a very inbred population. But we can do more. We can compare this with other uh, wolves from around the world, and wolves and dogs. This is just using some other data sets already public that uh, some other researchers have been genotyping 42,000 genetic markers, 42,000 SNPs distributed across the genome and with large sample sets. And we can see that this is a principal component analysis. Anyone that has done a little bit of genetics knows that it's just a way to distribute samples in the space closer together seeing that they are more similar. And we can see here all the dogs forming a group together. We go to the wolf side, we see here all the American wolves, down here very differentiated are the Italian wolves, and here, well, these are, let me see, yeah, mid, uh, Middle Eastern and Asian wolves, these are Central European, these are the Iberian, and then we can put here those four Iberian wolves. There are two here, one here, and this one is the one from Sierra Morena. Looks different from all other wolves, and it's moving in the direction of the dogs. Okay, and maybe in addition to the inbreeding, has all the kind of problems, this animal? Well, what we can do is when we have so many genetic markers, we can try to identify where the chromosomes are coming from. If we have a good representation of the genetic variability in wolves and in dogs, we could do something like that. We could characterize wolf chromosomes and dog chromosomes. And if we have enough differences, 
we could say this is a wolf chromosome and this is a dog chromosome. Wolf chromosomes are marked blue. We know that each one of us inherits two copies of each chromosome, one from the father and one from the mother. The same happens with the wolves. So we have the father with two wolf chromosomes, the mother with two wolf chromosomes, the daughter will have two wolf chromosomes. If we have a hybrid, we'll have that the, dot and that the offspring inherits one chromosome from the wolf and one chromosome from the dog. But when this individual reproduces, the first thing that does is recombination when producing sperm or eggs. And this big chromosome is broken into smaller pieces. And if this hybrid crosses with another wolf, what we will have is that, well, the offspring, if it has more recombination, the chromosome will break again. Is what Jose Antonio was telling us. We can have big blocks that are the same if they have a recent origin. So we can try to look at the size of the, the chromosomal fragments that come from dogs. I can say if they are very big, it's because the hybridization was recent. If they are very small, it's because probably it's something that happened many years ago and recombination has been breaking the chromosome many, many, many times. Okay. So let's look at the chromosomes of, this, of these wolves. Uh, and this is a beautiful example. This is a Portuguese wolf. We see that all blue, all wolf. There are some red bands, but could be just, well, typing errors and not everything is perfect. Wolves and dogs are very related. I don't take that as a sign of hybridization, but this is what we should expect. Basically all blue. So what happens with the Sierra Morena wolf? Red fragments imply dog origin. You see, here we have all the chromosomes organized. This is the two copies of chromosome one, the two copies of chromosome two, two copies of chromosome three. And we can see that there are huge fragments that are completely red. This animal, this wolf, this Sierra Morena wolf, had entire uh, chunks of DNA, very big fragments that were completely dog genome, completely hybridized. Okay. I added something else here. I changed the one on the right. You see that it said Wolf Portugal. Now it's Wolf Spain. Um, it's not because there is anything different, but this Wolf Spain and Wolf Portugal are two individuals that have been used in many genomic analysis, representing uh, pure wolves from around the world. And when we look at it carefully, we say, okay, this animal has been taken as a reference of a pure wolf in many genomic analyses published in high profile journals. We see that it has a lot of red as well, not as much as the one on the left. So in the wolf population, there are some genes coming from dogs that have been moving around in a small frequency, but hybridization occurred in the past and well, that animal looks like a wolf, behaves like, like a wolf, and has been used as a reference of wolf populations in genomic analysis, okay? And the reason to put this here was because that sample had been genotyped before using microsatellites, a small panel. And as microsatellites, they are perfect and wonderful genetic markers, but we tend to use just a few of them. And using just a few genetic markers, we see that the animal from northern Spain is this one that appears completely green, as if it was perfectly pure. So that using few markers, mm, it's very helpful, but we can miss lots of things going on in the population. That is better to try to amplify, to try to have whole genomes or as many markers as possible. And the ones from Sierra Morena is this one that is half red, half green. No? We can see that the, all the reference wolves appear completely green, all the reference dogs appear completely red practically. That tells us that wolves and dogs are well separated, but occasionally there's hybridization. So that animal from Sierra Morena had 30% of the genome coming from hybrids, from, from dogs. 
So is that one grandparent was a dog, apparently. And the small fragments in the genome, you can see it here, the Sierra Morena wolf had big chunks of DNA, red, coming from a grandparent. But then it has also very small, very old, some of the regions of the genome that are very fragmented. That can be suggesting that long ago in the past, there was already hybridization between dogs and wolves in this population. And we see also that the two copies of the chromosome here, one and the other one, the two of them are red. So basically the same block is inherited from the father and from the mother in breeding, what Jose Antonio was telling us earlier. So we have a population on the other side, sorry, you have the, the other wolf there, sorry, the wolf from Spain showing that what would you, what you would expect, red fragments, blue fragments all mixed up. There is no inbreeding in this case, but in Sierra Morena there was inbreeding. So this is telling us that this population in Sierra Morena that was declining, as long as it was declining, there was some cases of hybridization with dogs. Probably not dramatic, there was a little fragments of DNA from dogs coming into the wolf population, but the population kept declining, kept declining. Inbreeding started to appear, individuals started to be forced to mate with siblings, or father with daughter, or mother with son. Inbreeding leading to loss of genetic diversity, more hybridization. Now we have, after one of the grandparents was a dog, sorry, after one of the grandparents was a dog, we can still see that there was even more inbreeding. That's why we have these big chunks of DNA that are coming from the father and from the mother. Okay, so this is telling us what has been going on in the in this population. The wonder, the habitat was wonderful, but we know there are some other factors that can lead to this population decline, and. It occurs something that we can call the Ali effect. That is, when a population is very small, there are many other problems. It's not just that we are going to lose genetic diversity always at the same pace. Well, this individual, maybe uh, the individuals do not find a mate when the population is very, very small. Popula uh, problems accumulate. So this declining population was hybridizing, was inbreeding, and all that resulted in the extinction. Lack of genetic diversity does not kill. Are pathogens that kill, or is the lack of ability to solve problems? But in this case, probably the genetic diversity, the lack of genetic diversity helped in the extinction of this population. Okay. And with that, I'll leave it here. And thank you very much. Okay. Okay, then we have had two questions. Uh, one for Jose Antonio. And Pilar Rueda is asking if uh, the, um, the establishment of um, corridors, uh, bio biological corridors uh, for the uh, maintenance of uh, genetic variability levels uh, have worked. Si han funcionado, eh, si ha funcionado el establecimiento correcto. It's translating the question into English. For links, I guess. Well, that's something one of the priorities of the new project is to improve uh, connectivity between the incipient reintroduced populations and between them and with the remnants. So, so that's something that needs to be addressed. Um, there are several strategies that the project is considering um, based on landscape uh, permeability and, and establishment of uh, stepping stone populations, trying to facilitate connection between these isolated populations. So um, 
there is a landscape genetic well movement uh, study that has identified the features of the uh, landscape that facilitate or that are used by moving animals and that uh, provides some input uh, for, for deciding where to put the efforts in, in facilitating and this person but that's something planned and, and we'll see the good news is that natural uh, connection between these isolated in principle isolated populations have occurred occasionally yeah even between reintroduced populations. So that those are good news that maybe even in the current circumstances, natural connection will occur at some certain rate. We still have to see if that's a sufficient rate or, or it has to be somehow improved. Okay, thank you. And the last uh, one for Carlos. How many genomes from Sierra Morena were analyzed in the WOLF study? One. <laughs> yeah, that was all what we could get our hands on. And it seems that it's really basically impossible to find anything. And that was just, we were lucky that somebody kept a piece of tissue of that animal. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, we are a little bit over time. So thank you for your patience. And thank you, our. Um, uh, translators, yeah. <laughs>